Hi guys, welcome back. Welcome back to the Night Shift Podcast. I'm Zeno Roman and I'm back from vacation. Rested and energized and thrilled, just thrilled to be able to present this third part in Steve Campos series. Uh, I am biased, but to me, this is probably the most fascinating part if you like the first two get ready to get your socks blown off uh, only because Steve is such a special person who really really sees the world differently and I just find his observations absolutely remarkable so with nothing more to add here is part three of Steve Campus series I hope you guys enjoyed the first two I think you're really really going to enjoy this one And just in case I forgot to mention, this week's podcast is brought to you by ODM Rods. You can find them at odmrods.com. As many of you guys know, these podcasts are a lot of work, and we are fortunate to have guys like ODM and Super Strike and some other guys help out and make this possible. So enjoy this week's podcast. You also had a huge... um influence on modification and designing of, of a lot of gear we use today with, which we haven't even talked about you know namely being surf bags uh i know at one point you had a bungee cord wrapped around the surf bag to hold your you know your plugs in place um is is this the reason alone why you're trying to improve the quality of a surf bag that is the reason alone i had my aluminum insert surf bags the same as most everybody else did made by shoreline tackle they were canvas. They shrunk. So the aluminum insert would stick out an inch and a half higher than the canvas. It had a twist lock, which was now an inch and a half, two inches away. So I put a bungee around it. What I really hated was the noise that it made. You could hear someone walking down the beach a mile away rattling with their bags. So I, I told Alfred, I told him, when, yeah, I says, that's it. This is my last year. I'm going to figure something out. So... There were no Dacron surf bags. Bill Prinesberg of the Surfcaster, he had a Dacron surf bag with a some type of plastic insert. It weighed a ton. It was absolutely worthless in my opinion. It held a variety of plugs such as this. It held five and a half inch Rebel and a three ounce Gibbs bottle. Never in my life did I want those two plugs side in the bag side. at the same time. Yes. So, so to me, that was like a jack of all trades, master of none. So what I did was the same as everyone else. I was using gas mask bags. I was using surplus stuff. Four surf bags were available. But what everyone did was they got a bag, and then they decided to see what would fit inside of it. And to me, that was backwards. First, I wanted to have what I wanted to have. And build a bag around what you want to have, not have a bag and use what fits inside of it. That's a compromise. So I I knew I had to figure something out. So I was going out with this girl at the time, and she made some of her own clothing. So she said, well, making a bag is really quite easy. And she said, you just have to make it inside out. So I, I didn't concept was behind beyond my comprehension right. so took a paper supermarket bag and she showed me with with tape she taped it together and then and it was like yeah that that's it so then i got the idea that was what i was going to do and now i was going to search for a way to do it so my friend dean he had made uh, some bags out of a different material. It was only single layer material, but he found a speedy stitcher. And I didn't know there was more than one type of stitcher, so I bought another brand of stitcher. And mine was awful. I couldn't do anything with it. So I said to Dean, what am I doing wrong? And he said, well, throw away that piece of junk and buy this. So I bought the right stitcher and, wow, made things so much easier. But I didn't want a single layer surf bag. I wanted something. When Dean made the bag, it was for Breezy Point, and it was not going to be submerged. The single layer was fine for that, and and he made me a bag for Breezy, too. And I used it up until the time I replaced it with my own bag, and then I passed it on to somebody else that's probably still being used. 
So I made the bag and it took me a few bags until I figured out what I wanted, but I think it, it worked out so perfect. It's so much better than I ever could have hoped for. It just eliminated all my problems. I feel I had 10 or even 15 or 20 years on before anyone else even made any, um, I did it a little, even the new bags that are quite similar in design really are not that similar in design. I did use no welting on the outside. I only used basically three pieces of material. The main body was all one piece and the two side pieces. I put side flaps on it. No bags had side flaps. Um, and then I used the butyrite tubing because it was so lightweight compared to the plastic or aluminum inserts that, you know, other people used. And the butyrite tubing, I don't use, didn't use the three inch tubing like seems to be so common now. And everyone else puts in five or six plugs in a tube and then they're all tangled together. I only put two plugs in a tube because I didn't want to have any t deal with any tangles. And I, in the bottom orange caps for the butyrite tubing, I drilled small holes, not quarter inch holes. I drilled number 60 holes, which is the smallest fractional drill bit you could buy. And each, each single tube had a thousand holes drilled in it. So like in a two inch tube, I'd have over a thousand holes drilled in it Jesus. and no hook point. Through it. So yeah, it takes time to do that. But you know what? I was happy with the result. I could put the tube under the, under the slop sink and try to fill the tube with water it would never fill more than halfway full with water because it was draining out so fast, like a shower on the bottom. Right. It was like night and day. It was, and then I just started making more specialized and bigger and smaller and, you know, and then next thing, you know, other people started making them. So I guess, I guess it was a good idea. Oh, no, yeah. Well, how did you come up with the, the original material for it? Was there, you know, kind of elimination process? Well, this material is good for this, but this one shrinks. Like you said, I always hated the fact that the with the aluminum inserts, and like you said, that, that thing, once you get wet and salt on it, and it shrinks, and then, and then it should sticking out like an inch over. You can't even close the flap. So there's got to be a reason why you guys, guys came up with that. What is it, sailcloth or Dacron? Is that, is that the same thing? I used Dacron cell cloth because it was the only material I was aware of that was waterproof at the time. I have to remember there was no computers back then. So my research was done in alternate means. I had what was called the Thomas register, which was basically a yellow pages that was good for the whole United States. So you could look in and find some guy in San Diego who had this or some guy somewhere else who had that, which you, there would be no other way to know about this stuff. So that's where I got a lot of my stuff from, the Thomas Register. And it was basically I used it like everyone would use Google nowadays. It's just that it was that or nothing. If you didn't have a Thomas Register, you were dealing with your local phone book or your local people. And, I mean, look at like caulkers, those who were on the West Coast for years and years before anyone on the East Coast knew that they came, uh, that they were even around. And that's because there was no way for them to advertise them other than maybe a magazine here and there. And they were geared towards freshwater people and other trades and things like that. So there was really no way to find out about things. Like now you turn on a computer and people putting on pictures of fish that they caught three seconds earlier. You know what I mean? Back then, there was no way to know about anything other than to figure it out for yourself. Yeah, I, I sometimes wish we can go back to those days, at least when it comes to pictures of a fish caught at the same minute, which I never understood why in the world would you post a picture of your own bite and never mind. I, I can see wanting to show it to the world, but not at that moment. That just I have, I have a little issue with that. Um, my, the surf bells, you guys carried a lot more stuff than the guys carried these days. And I obviously these days seem everything modular and already made. But you also had to make a lot of improvement to the bag itself, right? The, the, you added all stainless steel clips and plates all welded together. I tried a lot of different things. And they just didn't work. I mean, there was a product that was called the Norset Surf Plate. It was $5 in the Long Island Fisherman. 
I sent away for this thing, it was a combination fish stringer and this and that and the gaff holder. I mean, it, it, it did nothing. It, all it did was make noise and jingle. <laughs> but I had, I had no, I made my surf, first surf plate. I, I, un, I unbolted a New York City no parking sign and I sawed it up with a hacksaw. I'm probably 12 years old, maybe, I don't know. But um, I started trying to make my own things, but I had, I couldn't weld, I couldn't do, I tried gluing like uh, clips onto plates that I don't know how that worked out. So anyway, my friend, the same guy who got the wads made, he worked for Grumman's and uh, good friends. And, and he says, I, I bet I can get those things welded up for you. He says, if it's going to take a favor, uh, I know how it works. So anyway, he welded them up, but those clips had bronze springs in them and all the springs melted. Now, I don't know anything about welding. I, I do know that it's that Grumman's probably hires good welders. Uh, the problem was with the product and not the welder. So then I had to find the same clips with stainless steel springs in them, and I did. And I had them welded up, and that's what I used for many, many years. And I did carry a lot of things, but I, I carried a lot of things because back then everyone used a gaff. I used a gaff. I used it more than for gaffing fish. I used a gaff to, to pick up the fish from the surf so I didn't have to put my hand in the mouth with the plug in there. I, I got a lot of fish that I would have not got without a gaff that I lost in close and I still had a shot and I'd been able to gaff. So there was a lot of things. I had a fish stringer. When I got to Montauk, everyone used brass uh, sash chain not a, or toilet chain as a fish stringer. So of course that was my first thing. But I started realizing that I could hear people's stringers when they would add fish to them. When they were walking with them, I could hear they were giving away a lot. They were giving away a lot of information. So I used rope. I was the only one that I saw that had rope for many years. Everyone was still using the chain. Well, their reasoning was when they would string bluefish, the bluefish would would chop up anything but chain. So I just strung my bluefish through the gills where it didn't go through the mouth. And I had no problems with the rope. And then I had, you know, pliers, the same as many people. I carried two, I carried three lights. I carried a red light and a white light. And then I carried a backup white light on the belt because there were no LEDs. Everything worked by bulbs. So like, you know, the bulb would instantly just decide to go out. I mean, at the worst the possible light. time. Yeah, you know, at the worst possible time. And I wasn't one for really using lights, but I used them when I needed them. And I had a, a waterproof container with pre-sharpened hooks on it. And an eel bag later on. I had the eel bag on there. I had a lot of things on there. You actually had so many things that you have to design your own suspenders to hold your shit together. I did. I Well... It, it became, you see, with the suspenders, it, it 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 did help. It helped a lot. So the suspenders were available with Vietnam vintage suspenders. They made Y suspenders. And I took those. I modified those to uh, work on the belt. And I had I had several belts. So I didn't use the suspenders on everything. On, on the wetsuit belt and the jetty belt, I did use the suspenders on. Because otherwise, it would just be always falling down. So why wouldn't you? And I noticed that as soon as I used the suspenders, it gave my surf bag, um, surf bag strap weight was dispersed over the suspenders, which didn't go down on, you know, onto your shoulder and always ache your shoulder. And then I made the bag to belt connector to take the weight off and things of that nature like that. So, yeah, the belt had a lot of stuff on it, and a lot of the stuff was heavyweight. I eventually did replace all the stainless stuff with nylon and make it lighter duty and, and less weight as I age into my 40s and things like that. But it's like anything else. It's, it, people nowadays seem to use a lot smaller bags 
with a lot less of a selection. And I just liked having a bigger selection because like I had said earlier, I was the kind of person who needed the selection because I might have the same plug in multiple configurations. And I never would go to a place with, let's say, a single load of something. I might have it, if I had three loads of something, I always had two of them with me type of thing because there was an overlap or one would be better than the other. Or as a tide got higher, I might go to the heavier load. As it got lower, I might go to the lighter load or other things of that nature. So it was just mat- really a matter of customizing things that I, that I did. And then now, like I never saw anyone with a red light. Now from what I understand, everyone's got red lights and, you know, everyone's got some of these uh, ideas that people in the beginning kind of like laughed at and things of that nature. I agree. I mean, well, I, I'm listening to you and, and I know that everything on your belt, obviously after listening to you for a while, I know that everything on your belt was there for a reason. There wasn't a single thing there that was unnecessary or they're just for vanity. But I also know that, let's say you just mentioned an eel bag and I know we haven't discussed eel that much, but... I know that the reason, and I'm assuming, I'm, I'm not going to put the words in your mouth, but I'm assuming that the reason the eel bag was in on your belt, unlike most guys who went back to the truck to get an eel, because you didn't want to get out of the water to put another eel on. Am I right? That's exactly like 100% right. Even in the case, I'm saying if this guy is taking 15 seconds to walk to, back to the beach for, to his bucket or his buggy, 15 seconds to walk back, that's 30 seconds that he can't possibly be catching a fish that I can. So at the end of the night, you know, that might end up an extra half an hour where your line's in the water where it wasn't. So would you rather spend that half an hour walking or reeling in fish type of thing? So the eel bag, I always had the eel bag. I always had the eel bag with me. No one else seemed to use one for whatever reason. I don't know. Um, but they, it just wasn't a thing up in the cave. Even on block, guys were carrying their buckets of eels and putting them down, you know, and 50 feet away. And then you have to walk over the seaweed 50 feet. And then you put an eel on, you cast it off on the first cast, and you walk back again. I'm just shaking my head. My <laughs> eels go right on my head. That shit is not you know? fun to walk with to, at, at, at daytime, at any time. Never mind try to go get with an eel, walk back into the surf. That's ridiculous. I'm sorry. That's that's too, way too much work and way too much wasting of time. Way too many things can go wrong all at once. Plus, everyone knows what you're using. Oh, that's a whole other thing. If you never yeah. the water and you never turn towards, towards the beach and you you don't know if someone's using an eel or a bottle plug. You don't know what they're using. I mean, you could hear the cast, but I mean, it wasn't like it is now where everyone, like the show me generation where everyone's like, look, look, look what I caught it on type of thing. No, it was like, if I'm watching someone catch fish, they're not going to tell me that they're catching them on. I got to figure it out for myself. Yeah. Well, what kind of, now we talk about eels specifically and, and just out of curiosity, what did you use? Did you use conventional uh, for on the cave for, let's say, eels or did you use spinning? Well, I use conventional for rig eels and spinning live eels. Uh-huh. Um, I, I, the, con, the, see, even like the eels, like when I was rigging eels, the way I was taught, and I use a modified Nat Piazza method. I say it's modified. Nat never showed it to me. He showed it to someone who showed it to me. But I kind of modified it for myself. But I use the Nat Piazza method, which is by far the most superior way. I see all these people with the way they rig eels online, and no thank you. Um, Nat had a much better method, in my opinion. So... I would use the conventional for that. And the way I was taught was you have to starve your eels first before you rig them. I remember Al Benson telling me that. Go ahead. I mostly got my eels in bulk in Connecticut when I was fishing the Cape, 15 cents a pound. uh, And the guy would starve them for you. So I would call up like a week ahead of time and say, I'm going to be coming up. I want... 20 pounds of eels and I would tell him how many to a pound that I wanted. 
seven to a pound was the, one, the way I specified it. So I, my eels would be about two and a quarter ounces each or so. And, uh, I, and he would starve them for me. So when you don't starve your eels, even, even I, would, I would starve them whether I was rigging them or fishing them live. Because when, when someone takes the eels out of the pot, the eels have been eating the bait that's in the pot. So now when you put those eels into any water, the water is going to turn black. It's going to be filled with sediment and all the stuff that these eels expel now from their bellies, which causes all the eels to die sooner. So when they're pre-starved, they would last longer in my eel jacuzzi because I would change the water once a day instead of once every two hours. Now, when you starve them, their bellies would be drawn in and they would be very tight, kind of like a tight pair of jeans. So when you didn't starve them, the skin would be flappy. And bloated. And yeah. after two, it would tear at the belly. Mm -hmm. It would tear. That, it took, took me 20 minutes to reveal 15 to 20 minutes. I never got below 15 minutes, and it's usually was 20 minutes. That's a lot of time for me to rig an eel. So why would I spend 20 minutes of time for something that's going to last two casts, where it might last all night? I mean, granted, hopefully a fish will rip it apart before that, but nevertheless, I wanted to start in the best situation that I can. And the star deals was definitely the way to go. And the way that everyone rigs their reels is they all, okay, I'm going to Siwash because I know now the rules have changed, but Siwash was always, always the hook used in a rig deal. And every Siwash hook is, they has a, a long point and a fairly long shank. And these guys rig the eels, they put the shank inside of the eel. Well, that's wrong. It, not wrong. Everything's opinion. I'm opinionated. Like, I, in my opinion, it's wrong because by doing so, you're missing out on two things. Number one is that eel can't flex for the length, length of that shank. That's two inches that that eel cannot move, right? Because it's got the steel inside of it, and it's very hard to unhook a fish. Because when you go to unhook a fish and the hook is tied to the eel, it's just going to rip. And your rigged eel is now going to be compromised. So the way Nat did it is he basically only had the eye of the hook inside the eel and maybe a quarter inch behind the eye of the hook. And the entire hook is exposed. That allows the entire eel to flex. It allows you to grab the hook to take it out of the fish instead of the eel body to take it out of the fish, and there is no tearing. It also it makes it more of a keel because now the weight, the ballast, is below the eel instead of inside the eel. So it's to me, the way Nat did it was genius, and it's the only way I've ever done it. And these people who put the shanks inside the hooks, like I said, everything works. But if you did it one way each way and see for yourself which is easier to take the eel out of the fish, which way is better, which way is going to rip the belly more, a lot of things. I think that most people would probably, if they tried it multiple ways, they would come to the same conclusion that that came to. Uh, I, so, this is the first that I hear of this because I've done it just the way you described that you don't like, and that's fine. Uh, like you said, opinions, no, and I what you said makes sense. What I'm trying to visualize, since this is an audio recording, is like, how did he connect the eye to the body? Meaning, usually you would slide that thing in, like you said, two inches, and then you would tie it to the eye, and then you would put another um, attach either with the with Dacron or with whatever you wanted to use to attach the shank to the body, which made it even less, like you said, supple to move. But how would he attach that eye to the body so it was actually strong? Oh, wait, you're talking about, oh, okay, so the line that comes through the body was basically holding on to the, to, to the whole rig, not, not that hook itself attached to the anal hole, right? It's, 
Right. The hook, hooks are tied with Dacron. Nat's weight was 50 pound micron uh, because that's what he used on his spools. So instead of throwing the line away, it got repurposed. And that's when I started. I then went to 80 pound Dacron only because why not? I, I wasn't worried about repurposing my old micron. I felt that 80 was better than 50. So I'll just, even though I never had any problems with the 50, I just went to the 80. But the strongest part of the eel is the anus itself. So if you do the stitching, the hook eye is stitched through the anus. It's never going to tear. That's never going to tear there. That's the toughest, that's the toughest part. So the whole eel behind the anus is now exposed instead of being inside of the body of the eel. It's, it's totally exposed. Yeah, well, very interesting. Now, is there a certain way that you like to work your rig deals as far as the technique? Because I, I always found it that different things worked at different times, for me personally. No, I, I can't say that, um, you know, I, I can't say I had anything specific that I did. I just cast things out and reel them in, as I always say. <laughs> um, but... but um, I, I have find a hard time believing that for a guy who pays so much attention to every single turn of his reel that he's just going to, you know, casually toss the rig deal in and go like, yeah, whatever. Well, you know, I don't really know. It. There's some things you just stop, you just do, right. right? You just do it. So that's just, it's just what I did. I just. I cast them out and I reel them in, the same as everything else. So I know that people think I'm kidding and things like that. It's yeah, you notice certain times when you are more likely to get hits and 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 things like that, and uh, and certain times that you know may let's say you drop a rod tip if you feel like the wave receding wave pulling against the eel or you know certain techniques that you use, but they become they just become automatic, so you don't really think about them. Yeah, I just thought it's that the rig real- deal versus live eel, there was a little bit of a difference for me personally oh. when I was <laughs> using them. The rig, deal, the rig deal to me requires a faster retrieval of deeper water. You, you've got a half ounce of hooks on, on a rig deal that you don't have on a live eel. So, you know, they. I may not use use them at the same time or or maybe or maybe i would i always had rig deals with me sometimes they weren't the best lure to use so you know if a a needlefish was better i would use that and whatever worked best for me i wasn't trying to prove any points i wasn't proud i wasn't like i'll get this fish to hit this yellow daughter if it's the last thing i do i'm like no i'll just use a black red rebel that's what they want why did i you know I'm not going to piss in the wind if I. Were you ever surprised when you were on Block Island and had these humongous eels uh, around your sand eels that the eels didn't work more effectively? Well, they did work, kind of. They there was there was one night that they generally the needlefish just worked better. There were times there were so many times where. Guys were throwing eels or chunks or whatever. Wow. Just the fish just wanted the bugs. But vice versa. One night I remember, uh, we fished all night. It was now after daybreak. The fish were charging down the beach. Their dorsals were out of the water. I mean, the fish, a few fish were being caught. But you should have had a fish on every cast, right? And guys, one guy got it on the Charlie Grays. One guy gets it on this. One guy gets it on that. Well, a friend of mine, uh, New York guy, um, he had a single eel in a coffee can. He had to walk all the way back to his truck to get it. And he cast it out. He ended up with a 57 that right in front of me. He caught it right in front of everyone. Uh, and that was his only eel. Yeah, I was sure I wish I threw an eel that day, <laughs> but I didn't. But that eel, you couldn't buy eels. So people were going into creeks and lifting up rocks and finding these tiny, the eel that he had was probably about the size of a pencil. He probably could only cast it 15 feet, but that's the fish were right there. So, but yeah, many, 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 many times the needlefish outfished the eels and 
people and people were always like saying, "Oh, the fish will never turn down eels." And I seen fish turn down eels plenty of times. So, yeah. But when the sand eels were around, I actually was using smaller rig eels, like twelve inches and under, and they were working great. So I I don't think that they look like eels to fish. I think they look like sand eels to fish. So I don't really know what they look like to fish. I'm not a fish, but I know that they were working. And we were rigging them with slightly smaller hooks instead of a 9-0 and 8-0. We were going to, you know, an 8-0 and a 7-0 or even a 7-0 and a 6-0. Or even just not no tail hook, just like a giant sidewash hook with a, a tiny little eel. Did you ever find Every, did you ever find success with not rigging an eel and just using a dead eel as is in a pinch? Plenty. I prefer dead eels to live eels almost always. Um, the problem with uh, live eels is kind of the same problem with rigged eels, but for a different reason. When you have a live eel, it requires deeper water or a faster retrieve because that live eel is going to go straight to the first rocks and try to hang you up. Now, when you have, when an end, when a fish hits it, the hook is in the head. So quite often, again, despite what I've read to the contrary, the fish grabs the tail of the eel first. Then you have to wait for him to turn that eel around in his mouth and you set the hook. Well, I miss a lot of fish on those live eels, and so you figure out how they're taking it that night, or, or maybe you never figure out how they're taking it that night. But you miss a lot of fish. With dead eels, you don't have any of that. They just take it, and they get hooked, and that's it. And sometimes there is no, or maybe like a two-second delay on a hook set instead of a five-second delay like on a live eel or something like that. But with the with the dead eels, I could reel them in much slower. I could fish them right over the rocks till I feel it hit a rock and just kind of like pull it over the rock. You could feel it being pulled over the rock. You could fish them not like a bucktail or something, but you could use them to kind of telegraph their surroundings better than you can with a live eel, which the second it hits the water, it's going to try to hang you up on the bottom. You just brought something up that you're not a believer in a bass eating headfirst all the time, right? And and you have a reasons for this, right? Because, yeah, because the, the common work. knowledge or common whatever you want to call it is that bass always has to eat headfirst because it has no teeth, but you have a different opinion on that. I do have a different opinion on it because, again, everything I read was to the contrary. So... I, I guess I started realizing this with the needlefish. Yeah, I caught plenty of fish that hit the head of the needlefish, but I caught more that targeted the tail. And it's quite apparent as to what part of the plug most of the time. It's quite apparent when you go to unhook the fish how the law was approached. You could see how it was approached. And I could see all the scrape marks on the needlefish. You could see how they were. And and that's what I come down, and I don't care what you think. I don't care what anyone thinks. I I believe that most fish that hit needlefish attack it from the tail. I've seen I've seen the fish hit needlefish plugs. I've seen fish hit needlefish, not needlefish, sand eels. I see watch them slurp down sand eels. I've heard them slurp down sand eels, and I don't think it's the same. Whereas let's say on a metal lip plug. Most of the fish hit the head. It seems to me, in my opinion, most of the fish target the head. But on needlefish, don't. I, you also, I think you told me you also seen like a 53-pound fish eating a, a, a needlefish before even guy knew he had it, right? Yes, I, at Southwest Point. Unfortunately, I wasn't the guy catching the fish. I was too late. He was the only guy in the water, broad daylight. I was on top of the cliff. And there was, he was fishing the left side of Southwest Point, which is the shallower side. And because it's a shallower side, either you get these little, you know, shoal, shoal breaks, I call them, the little waves. It might only be a foot or two, but they blocked his vision to his plug. He could not see it. I was on the top of the cliff, and I could see it. I was using a fluorescent green plug, neofish, plain as day. I seen that fish come and hit that plug plain as day, 
and there was probably a full two to three second delay before I watched him set the hook. And I told him the whole story, saw the whole hit, how it hit, everything else like that. And that fish just came up right behind that plug and just slurped it in like it was nothing and then turned and boiled. And, and when the fish turned and swam in the opposite direction, that's when he felt the hit and that's when he set the hook. And I was shocked at so long a delay because I'm like saying, how long a delay on my fish? How many, you know, how soon? Do I know that sooner? I'm getting a hit or not know? Exactly. Exactly. And after and after that, I started paying more attention to what I uh, I call, which I also never seen this discussed, is um, swim by, as I call them. It's like when you're reeling in your plug and all of a sudden a fish swims next to it, maybe attempting to hit it, maybe not, maybe missed it. But all of a sudden you're reeling in and you feel the only way I could describe it is your plug is all of a sudden it tumbles. Like it's all of a sudden in thin air instead of in water. And you just feel something is not right. And then a second or two seconds or three seconds later, boom, there's your hit. There, that was your fish swimming and checking that out, checking out your this display, The water displacement back. on the actual plug is what you felt, right? Is that what I'm, what I'm getting at? exactly what I believe it is. And I've seen it happen to many people and most people don't realize it's happening. Oh, but I've seen it happen to a few of my friends. They know exactly what it was. And, uh, and you know, and if you're aware of it and you're ready for that hit, or if you don't get that hit you in, in two or three seconds, you do something about it, you know, to try to coax that hit out of that fish. So many times, like you'll, I'll be reeling in another two or three turns on the squitter, which is probably only a foot of line, and I didn't get that hit. And all of a sudden, I'll just increase the speed and boom. How many times, like people, like, you know, increase the speed on something, and, and as soon as you do, you get that hit? Well, that's happened to many people over the years, I'm sure. Yeah, I, and I, I'm, it, my, I think this, to some extent when we say, and I, I say it, I don't know if other people say it, but I, I know myself, is sometimes I swear to God, I can tell the hit before it actually happens. And, and I think what you just explained is exactly what it is. Is something different is in your whole sequence of retrieve that you know it's not normal. It's not, you know, exactly. it's not a piece of weed. It's not a rock. You know it's something live because the way it's telegraphed to your rod. That's exactly the point I was trying to get across. Yep. yep. But but you also have this theory about the, the fish following the hooked fish too, right? The breaking off from the pod. Absolutely. That, that isn't even that isn't even a theory because it, it it was proven to me. So when someone proved it to me and then I started connecting the dots previous to that and afterwards, I know it's true. And, and what it is, is um, it was in broad daylight. Uh, it was at breezy point and it was during the mullet run and I was into a nice fish and uh, another guy, uh, well, he's quite well known in New York and in the Cape. He cast it over my line, and and I turned to him and kind of said something to him. And he and his answer was, "What are you worried about? I know what I'm doing. You know what you are doing. Now we both have fish." So he his what he said to me is, he says, "Whenever you see someone reeling in a fish, if you cast behind them, if you know them, and you know they you're a friend." You're going to hook up because those fish will break off from the school and follow that hooked fish in. And I've seen it many, many, many times over the years at Breezy. Five or six fish follow a hooked fish right up to the gaff where you had two or three gaffs. You could have just gaffed those fish that were still in the water. They just stood there until the fish was lifted out of the water and then they swam off. And the example I, I, I say is I had said to you previously was, Look at any, it doesn't have to be striped bass. Look at any fish, top and snook. Look at all those drone shots of a guy on a fly rod. He hooks a fish. Those fish break right off from the school and follow that fish right in. And that's why it's my belief in certain places, like Montauk, when you get a guy, he's on the, you see a guy hook up 
and then two or three minutes later, you see the two guys next to him hook up. It's because I believe those the fish he hooked in brought in other fish, which were now were in the range of the guys closest to him, and now they all ended up with those fish. So it's it's kind of like the same mindset of guys that will throw a tuna popper and excite the fish and then throw a, a, a fly or something and try to catch a tuna on a fly or something to that is they get the fish excited. Well, the fish are excited already because they're following in that fish. Why? I don't know. I can only assume they're following it in because they don't understand why that fish broke off from the school. So they follow it in. But I've seen it over the years. If you start thinking back to all of a sudden, it's like, those two or three guys were in the right spot. No, no. Maybe they were and maybe they weren't. Maybe that one guy, the first guy to catch a fish, brought in the other fish, and the other guys, either knowingly or unknowingly, were able to catch them because their plugs were now in the proximity of the fish that weren't there before. And I, I think that's as simple as that. And I've seen many, many examples of it with my own two eyes and on, on video of fish breaking off and following in a hooked fish right to the shore. I mean, so many people have seen yeah, it. No, so I, many I, times I, I guess we'll never know if it's curiosity or is, is something that they have to do or they do it because they're hungry or they perceive to be food. I, I have no idea, but it's definitely something that I've seen, especially like you said, on a drone shot. I've told you this before. I, I In the spring, usually I'll, I'll throw the camera with, with a plug with no hooks and a leader down in Point Lookout, and I'll just reel it in just to see what's going on. And and uh, oftentimes you'll see much more than you think you actually see because there's with the bluefish in the spring, you generally there's no sign of activities for the most part. It's not like crazy blitzes in the summertime and fall, and yet they are there and they'll follow one fish. Sometimes I'll hook it on camera, and there'll be three fish following it right off to school. So. So that's kind of obvious. And you said before that you use squitters for live and, and rig deals, but what kind of reels did you use for spinning before the van stalls? Well, I never really use squitters for live reels. Right. I use squitters for For spinning, I used cracks and luxors and pens, the same as everyone else used. Okay. And how, how, how did you come up to... Uh, either advise or, or, or you know have one of the first van stalls because you know, now van stalls is considered the ultimate reel. But like, what what did you have to do with that reel? I'm curious. I know that you did, but I I, I don't want to put the words in your mouth. I want to hear from you. Well, I just what happened was uh, Bill Prinsberger, the Sarcaster, was advertising aftermarket crack spools and crack spools were they were kind of tough to I like to have a lot of spools for my reels like I previously explained and and, and it's not like you could go buy things for crack but for the most part so anyway every time I tried to get these spools from Bill he never had any I don't know if he ever had any but I was on pretty good terms with Bill personally and he finally put me in touch with Rob and he said, this is the guy who makes the spools. Just talk to him. So I did. I, I spoke to him and he was going to be making this at the time. Bill was calling it the surf 300, the van stall. And, um, we started talking and I told him, I says, well, I said, I, I like that concept a lot. I said, but there's certain things that are deal breakers for me. And if you make it the way I want it, I will buy it. So he said, I'll make whatever you want, but you're going to need 30 reels for me to make you a special version. Not a problem. I got him way more than 30 reels on that order. And the differences I had that I, that I specified were I wanted a torpedo handle. I didn't want a doorknob handle. I don't like that style handle. Uh, I'd never seen a guy, a safe cracker, open up a safe using the heel of his hands. He always uses his fingertips because they're more sensitive. And I felt I was able to feel things with my fingertips that I otherwise wouldn't be able to feel. So that's what I wanted. 
a doorknob grip to me was superior tool to reel in fish, but 99.99% of the time I was not reeling in fish, I was reeling in lures. So that was the one thing. I wanted the reels to be timed with the handle at about four o'clock and the spool exposed. Previous to my order, any everything was random. The concept really wasn't grasped or felt needed or whatever, I can't say. But anyway, I was able to time all my own reels previous to the van stall, but the van stall being they were being made, just have them made times to begin with. So there was that. I didn't want any um, any perforations in the side of the spool. I uh, I don't like that idea. I think people do it because they think it looks cool the same way I think people do most things nowadays, not because it is better, because it looks better. Uh, to me, uh, perforations on the side of the rotating head means I have sandy cold water being splashed against my fingertips at all times because I'm holding on to the real stem. Why would I want that? I wouldn't want that. So as long as the holes are in the back only, it's going to dispel the water. It's not going to it's not going to seize up underwater. Like if you don't have holes in the bottom, you'll get, you'll, it'll like lock up almost. Um, and Rob was happy to do everything and we gave him the order. And, and when we picked up the order, our next project was the pliers. Now the pliers weren't supposed to be the way they came out. They were supposed to be, I told Rob, I wanted parallel action pliers like the sergeants, but he came up with these and, and now I think they've been a staple ever since. So that's the involvement with the van stalls. So you had nothing to do with the actual idea of putting the slots in, in, the, in, the, in the spool being an open. You still to this day would prefer a closed spool with the, with the holes on the back. I would not fish one. I would not buy, would not have bought the reel with this. The first thing I would have did was I would have put masking tape in the back and would have filled all those slots up with epoxy, just like I did on the uh, old cracks and Luxors when I took out all the bail hardware. I, I sealed everything up with epoxy for that exact reason. I didn't want that water spraying on my fingers. I don't know why people like that, but I don't. So you just mentioned about the spool being in a certain place when you handle it in a certain uh, place in the rotation. Explain to people why is this important. Well, if you look at any reel, but I guess the easiest reel to point out is a crack or a Luxor. They actually came with a heavy chromed brass knurled lock nut, a rubber washer and a stainless washer. And that was to lock the handle from turning on a cast. So again, I mean, these reels were made in France. I can only assume they were made for bait fishing. So they were made so when a guy casted, the rotating head wouldn't turn on the cast and catch the line. Now, the reels came with bells, even cracks and luxos came with bells. So what happened is now you have that heavy that weighs like an ounce. It was a very heavy piece. And it served no purpose because the handle wouldn't turn if it was in the what I liked was the four o'clock position. Everyone says six o'clock, but well, different strokes for different folks. I have four o'clock. That was my preference. So it wouldn't turn. So the only reason why they had to include that was because the reels were untimed from the factory because the piece, pieces were randomly machined and put on and you turn, you change the handle. It's, it's not going to end up in the same position. Just like if you change the handle or the main gear on any reel, the reels have to be retimed. So I just didn't want that problem. So they, with the handle back and the spool fully out, you're going to get the best cast because the line is not going to hit side of the rotating head or the roller inadvertently catch the roller 
or if the handle turns and the roller turns on the rotating head, it's going to catch the line. Or if you have a bail, the bail's going to snap close. And that's why 99.9% of people who have problems with their bail closing, I guarantee that if they were to check their timing, that their timing would not be anywhere near the four o'clock position. Were you were you exaggerated like, when you told me that you never casted or broke off a plug in your life? Yeah, I was exaggerating. I said I don't I don't remember ever snapping off a plug since I got a driver's wow. license. I remember snapping off a one and a half ounce chrome creature papa uh, on a die with twenty five hundred reel when they first came out. And I remember the embarrassing sound that thing made. I mean, 30 guys' heads turned and looked at me. And I had to figure out why that happened. And since I figured out why, I don't remember ever breaking, snapping off a law, ever, with either spinning or conventional. Uh, since then, I'm sure maybe it happened, but it certainly wasn't like some people snap off three or four or five a night. Uh, it, it's got to be a problem there. Now, granted, I never said I was the greatest caster in the world. Maybe I didn't cast to reach the horizon. I, I don't know. I casted far enough. Now, when I did build my rods, it was explained to me that you could build a rod for the cast or for the fish. So, I guess maybe that's old school philosophy, but I always put on the extra guide. I, my, again, it's got to be better 51% of the time. So 51% of the time I felt I stand a better chance of landing the fish that I hooked with the extra guide on because I could apply more pressure than losing a fish that I would not have hooked because one less guide would give me 10 feet greater distance, which would expose my law to 10 feet greater potential for a hit that I would likely have a 10% greater chance of losing because I couldn't put on as much pressure on the fish, if that makes any sense. I don't know if that is understandable in any way, shape, or form. It's understandable but, because, like I told you before, you should definitely have been a gambler because the odds, the way you play odds is, is just incredible. I mean, this is basically what, what comes down to at the end of every conversation is that you are trying to maximize your odds in everything that you do. Exactly. It's, it's again... It, over the course of the years that I fished, which was a lot, sure, I'm sure that that cost me many fish, but I, in my mind, it gained me more than it lost. I just, it is, if it caught me one more fish, then it was the right choice for me. Yeah, I'll lose that one, but I'll get these two instead. So it all comes down to, it all comes down to your poss the possibilities in, in making things in, in the best favor that you can. Is there anything that sticks in your mind as far as being the best trip, the best night, the, the best something? You know, everybody always seems to have, oh, this was the best night ever. And I know you had a lot of great nights and a lot of great years, but is there anything you're looking back that sticks to you in a special way about this whole sport and everything that you've been through? No, I, I had a lot of great nights, and I, I can only say maybe the greatest night was my first 50-pounder, well, it was a day time, but my first 50-pounder, um, because it was the manner in which I caught it, which was pretty good, I think. Um, or was it the biggest fish, or was it the most fish? It's different for everybody, but I, I've had a lot of memorable nights, and, and maybe they weren't even... Maybe it was a night where I figured something out that somebody else didn't figure out. Maybe it wasn't big fish. Maybe, you know, but it's just a sense of satisfaction. I have noticed a lot of patterns over the years or, that I feel that because I picked up on them, maybe I did better than if I wouldn't have picked up on them. Um, what, what is the best advice that you would give to the surfcaster today? Not that you are somebody who likes to give advice to, to others, but what do you see today? I mean, there's so many things. I, I think this is actually a stupid question, to be honest with you. My best advice would be not to pay any attention to this, <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> my, best advice, 
my best advice is to do what's right for you. And my best advice is to, to believe nothing that anyone says, no maker, no manufacturer, no anything. I mean, I see people that are just afraid. Well, Bobby says to use this. Uh, Joey says to use that. Well, who cares what Bobby and Joey says? Your name's not Bobby or Joey. You do what you think is the right thing to do. You know, who cares? Who cares what somebody else thinks? Who cares what the plug maker thinks? I, it's not that I have any less respect for the plug maker. It's just that plug maker maybe thinks that this size hooks better. And I think this size, the, here's what I see, like certain patterns I see since I stopped fishing. I see that hooks have gotten smaller and fewer. So people... People put on these tiny little hooks. Have you tried the next size bigger? Is there a reason why that size is on there? Is there a reason why you think that size is the best size? There's one thing when it comes to hooks I've noticed. See, I view hooks, anything hanging off of a plug or anything that's inside of a plug, I consider to be ballast. It's either internal ballast or it's external ballast. Where internal ballast and external ballast are two totally different, two, two totally different things that affect the plug. You can take a certain amount of weight inside the plug, but once you reach a certain threshold, it now, in my opinion, becomes a counterproductive amount of weight. But if you take that same weight and hang it outside of the plug, it affects it differently. And a perfect example would be before I was mentioning that there's only, in my opinion, two different types of swimming plugs, a metal lip, something with an equilateral radius round and something that has two different dimensions like a Rebel or a Redfin or a Hellcat or anything like that. The ballast is where the ballast is located is going to cause the plug to respond differently. And when you upsize the treble hook, let's just say there's a two and a half gram difference between a 3 0 and a 4 0. What I'm saying is if you take that two and a half grams and hang it on the outside of the plug versus putting it on the inside of the plug, those two plugs that weigh exactly the same are going to swim totally different. And all it's going to take you is, is putting that plug in the water three feet in front of you with your rod and just making it move five feet where you could just watch it. Just, just watch. You'll see for yourself. No one is doing that or they don't have a preference or they don't think it makes a difference, whatever. It, everything is going to make a difference. Everything works, but everything is going to make a difference. In my opinion, one way is going to be superior to the other most of the time. So again, it just comes down to playing the odds. I want the way that's going to work better 51% of the time. I'll suck it up when I do worse 49% of the time, as long as I can do better 51% of the time. But why would you choose to do better 49% of the time when you could do better 51% of the time? It's counterproductive. I'm going to say that, that some to a lot of people, that one percentage of time is not as important as it is to you. I would have to say that because uh, maybe they're not as passionate or they they might not have the same frame of mind of, of what the success is. There's, there's no doubt. There's no doubt about that, that people are involved and are looking for different things. Some people want to clear the head. Some people want to get away from their family. Some people just want to relax. I'm talking to the people who I believe are more serious about it. Now, when I say serious, the guys that I saw reeling in quarter pound spools of Andy under the bathroom stall in the Montauk uh, bathroom. Right. But yeah, those were serious guys. The guys who were in the middle of a blitz at Southwest Point reeling and filling up their only spool of line because they got spooled or their line broke. 
these are serious guys. They're just choosing what I feel is an inferior method to attain what they're looking for. If you don't care whether you catch anything, why are you listening to this in the first place? <laughs> Who cares? That's a good point. But you know what I'm saying? Yes. So for the people who they want, they're going fishing to catch fish, not to make casts, this is probably maybe more important to them. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I always say this to people. I guarantee that I got skunked more than anybody. I got skunked more than anyone. So again, the more you go, the more you're going to get skunked and the more you're going to catch. You just have to take that ratio and try to make it lopsided in the catch versus getting skunked upon them. But let's face it, when you know, when you didn't catch fish the last 10 nights, you're probably not going to catch fish on that 11th night. But everything, like when your car breaks, everything's good until it's not. You know, your power steering is working. Now it's not. Well, the same thing with fishing. Those fish are going to turn on eventually. Well, you're going to start catching them eventually. So the more you go, the better you, you're increasing your chances exponentially of catching fish. But you're also increasing your chances of getting stumped, <laughs> right? The more cast you... So it's like everything else. It's, it, it just comes down to that 1% may not be important to... It may not be important to you, but to me it was the most important thing because that 1%, that might be all the big fish I ever caught fit into that 1%. Right. Yeah, that's a so without that's that, a great point. Yeah, one percent is what I want because I don't care how many fifty pounds anyone's caught, whatever the fifty pounds they caught, they're in the vast minority. Of their overall cash, they're in that one percent. So why you would cheat yourself? Why you would make one cast knowing that that leader was sprayed and you made that one cast with it? Well, guess what? Now you hook the fish. Now what are you going to do? You're going to back off on a drag. You're going to you're going to fight that fish differently because you know that you made a cast with something compromised. That never entered into my equation because every cast I made, I knew my tackle was a hundred percent when I made the cast. It may not be a hundred percent when I hooked the fish, but it was a hundred percent when it left when that bug was cast. So I can fight that fish. Any way I want to fight it. If I lose it, I lose it. If I get it, I get it. But I don't have to work around um, a compromised, a compromised equation because my tackle had a nick in it, uh, my leader had a nick in it, or that snap was I don't like I, that snap open too easy, or you know that was never in. It was never part. Nothing I had to worry about. I had to worry about that fish cutting me off on a rock that I didn't know was there because I can't control that. So I worry about the things I can control and don't worry about the things I can't control. For someone who was so passionate about the sport and who was so uh, detail-oriented, what happened when you just one day walked away? I mean, and walked away wasn't like, you know, you just, you just walked away to Canada, I mean. I just, I don't know because it's, it's something that I never perceived happening to me ever i never thought i would not want to catch striped bass i never thought i could care less now i don't know what happened what happened was that i guess i just felt that i didn't have the same opportunities anymore i was tired of catching 18 to 22 pound fish um you know it was like it was almost like automatic. Yeah, if I go to this spot at this time and use this type of lure and whatever, this is what I'm going to catch. But after a while, it was like, you know what? I don't want another 18 to 22 pound fish. Yeah, it's a lot better than catching a 17 to 21 pound fish, but it's only one pound better. And it's not the difference between a 49 and a 50. It's the difference between a 17 and an 18. Who cares? I don't care. I don't care. I, you know. It's just that, and and it's it's and don't take this the wrong way. When I was fishing, the selling fish, I mean, that was just it was part of the equation. Yeah, I fished for many years when I didn't sell fish, 
and I threw back many fish when I was selling fish. Uh, I wasn't one of these like 16 inch legal or seller type of people. I didn't want to fish for 16 inch fish to begin with. So when, when it's costing you thousands of dollars to catch something that you really don't care if you catch in the first place, I guess maybe that's, that was it. I don't really, I really don't have an honest answer for you because it's something I can't really explain to myself. And there is the ending of number three. It's one of those podcasts when I listen to, I really don't want it to end, but it does. Thank you again for listening. We appreciate your feedback. We appreciate all the positive reviews you guys have left. And we also appreciate you being subscribed to our publication at surfcastersjournal.com, who makes all this possible. Thank you. Tight lines. The fall is around the corner. Have a great fall.